Hello everyone, thanks for attending. This is my talk about ECC engines. Um, I plan first to explain a bit uh, what they are and why they, they are used, uh, how do they apply to the non-subsystem, and also I want to give you an insight of um, what are the recent changes in the spy non-subsystem to better support them. Uh, so, I, I'm Mikkel, I work at Bootlin, and that's not my first talk about uh, MTD. Um, but let's start with uh, the, 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 the context and the explanation of what an ECC is. Well, it stands for Error Correcting Code. Uh, let's have an example first. You want to share an information, but you know that you may have disturbances on the way to um, share it. What do you do? So if you are in a crowd, you will nat naturally speak louder. That's a possibility. Or maybe you will repeat yourself as well. Well, in the world of, uh, in the digital world, speaking louder is not always possible, uh, but it would mean increasing the power when transmitting the information. However, uh, you can repeat, and adding redundancy is very often what we choose to do. But of course, uh, adding redundancy adds more latency as well. So, um, how do you use an ECC engine? Well, it's very simple. You provide the engine with uh, your data, your actual data, what you want to transmit or store or anything, and the engine will process this data and create uh, redundancy information that will help uh, when retrieving the data to, um, to, to detect errors that could happen and eventually correct them as well. We prefer to transfer readable data. So most of the time we, in our algorithms, the prepended data is the raw data, and then we uh, we suffix that with a, um, a few bytes of uh, redundancy information. Um, but we don't mix them. Uh, we, we try to keep uh, readable data. Of course, then the data you must share is longer than the data you actually want to transmit. So the point and the goal of uh, an ECC engine is detect uh, errors, at least one, maybe more, and also correct them eventually. eventually. And it's not reserved to communications. No, uh, it's already widely used uh, with storage media as well. Uh, if I take a, a very easy example um, about audio communications, there is the NATO phonetic alphabet. This alphabet is known by a lot of, uh, is, is widely known already. And if I tell you Lima Indian November Uniform X-Ray, what you should understand is Linux. And no matter uh, if, you are, if you hear every word correctly, if you just hear Novem, for instance, you know that it's November. I mean November because uh, the words in this alphabet are really different from each other. That's what mathematicians call the distance. The problem is with binary data, you don't necessarily have this possibility. Um, if you take any number, let's say, let's take 0xA, which is binary 1010. A single disturbance, no matter where it appears, will produce a valid number. For instance, 0010, which is the 0x3, uh, 2, sorry. Um, any change in, the, in this binary value will lead to another valid number. Of course, repeating may be a solution. So if you send twice all the bits, 1010 becomes 11001100. You can detect a single bit error. That's fine. You can't correct it though. 
And there is another problem. There is a 100% overhead. You have to share twice as much data as you actually want uh, to share. So this is a very simple algorithm, but works. Another another algorithm would be could be uh, repeating three times the same bit. That's one 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 zero 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 one 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 zero zero zero. You can still detect a single bit error, but you can very easily uh, correct it. But of course, it's also very costly. It's even more costly than the repeating twice, of course. So people invented other mathematicians invented other methods, which are much more efficient and achieve almost uh, the same, uh, which have uh, almost the same results. Uh, a byte, uh, for instance, in your communication, you use parity bits. In a, in a byte, you'll have seven bits of data and one parity bit. You have to negotiate first if you want an even or an odd parity. Depending on what you choose, you will count the number of ones in the world you are transmitting, and uh, you'll have you'll add a one or a zero at the end, depending on if you want a odd or an even parity of ones. This way, the 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 your interlocutor will um, immediately know if there is a corruption in the world. It cannot uh, correct it but it will detect an error with only a 15% overhead, which is much better than the 100% we've seen with the repeating algorithm. ECC, as I told you, is uh, already widely used for storage. RAM chips use it ext extensively. All te technologies use parity bits. Uh, today, um, most of them, I think, use a one-bit Hamming correction. And you may have um, you may have uh, you may find chips with a much uh, stronger correction now. Compact disc are compact discs are another example which is very interesting because uh, compact discs are not prone to bit errors at least not natively. Um, they are known to be rather stable compared to NAND, for instance. But you may have dust or scratches on their faces, so you may lose data and you may lose a batch of the data. So you must be able to correct um, several hundred or thousand consecutive bits. For your information on a regular CD, uh, 4096 bits should be recoverable, consecutive bits should be recoverable which is uh, more or less the same as a one millimeter thick scratch. So now let's focus on the NAND, um, on the NAND technology, why we need um, error correcting codes and which ones more precisely. So first, let's have a short insight into the technology. It's very cheap, okay? That's uh, that's uh, that makes it very unstable because then cheap the the fact that it's cheap comes from the fact that it's uh, that it has a very high density, and the technology is pretty simple at the physical level. The fact that it is unstable uh, means that you should expect ECC errors and you should treat them. So you need an ECC engine. It's mandatory. Um, at the physical level, NAND devices can consider that they are made of a huge amount of tiny, uh, of tiny nine cells. A cell may be seen as a bucket, a bucket with a small hole at the bottom. Depending on if the bucket is empty or filled, you consider a binary zero or binary one. And um, you may have um, different uh, source of errors when looking at the actual level in the bucket. First, time is your enemy with non-technology. You remember there is a hole at the bottom of the bucket. So, um, with time, you may not read the same value in a non-cell. 
Intensely, int intensive use is also an issue. Uh, in the case of NANs, we are talking about erase cycles because erase cycles involve very high voltages compared to the other operations. And this always damages a little bit the cell. So it's like if the wall gets bigger. Uh, read disturbances are a pro problem as well. Imagine that every time you look into a bucket, you are shaking the other ones around. And finally, level sensing. Uh, the question here is, what is a full bucket? What is an empty bucket? It's not that easy as it sounds to answer this, this question. For single level cells, so SLC NANs, which are uh, spread uh, in, in Linux world, world um, there is uh, only a zero or one in the in the cells, so it's a bit easier. But for MLC NANs, for instance, you have two bits per cell, and a two bit two bits means you can have zero 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 one one zero or one one. These are these are four values. Um, so you have three intermediate levels to tune. And there is, as a side note, there is a feature in these names that usually is if you retrieve data that you think is unrecoverable, uh, thanks for this, thanks to the ECC engine, uh, you may ask the, the, the non-chip to tune these levels and try again. This is a really simple explanation of the non-technology. If you want uh, something much more detailed and uh, closer to the physical aspects, I already gave a presentation about that. Um, the, slide, the, the links are clickable in the slides and the slides are available already. So uh, please check out this, this conference for that. So, um, it's particularly problematic that we will have more and more bit errors with newer chips. The non-cells get smaller, the density rises, the probability of bit error as well, and the number of this, the, the, the probability of disturbances uh, is rising too. Uh, so we need reliable corrections that suit the chip requirements and layout. You have to follow the chip layout, so um, you need to to be. You can't use more um, bytes than the, than available to store your redundancy information, and you shall also um, limit yourself to what the chip requires in terms of correction, because using a too high, a too strong correction involves more processing power, of course, more power consumption. Uh, it adds delay. So every time you will read a page, uh, you will have an additional delay, uh, which gets bigger and uh, bigger of a head, which is the size of the additional information that helps recovering the data. So we usually try to be just as much as strong as it is required for the chip, but it's not no, not really more. Um, here is what happens uh, for an ECC engine when a write is requested. So uh, a write it it works the same in the transmit transmit path of uh, communication, of course. So the host controller will provide the ECC engine um, chunks of data. The ECC engine is supposed to take each chunk one by one, process it. It will this will create uh, the check bytes, and check bytes will be will um, be suffixed at the end of the page. The page the non page is made of uh, inbound data. That's where you store your own real data and the out of band uh, and the out of band area which is there to store um, the check bytes in the other direction 
when the ECC engine is supposed to uh, retrieve original data from possibly corrupted uh, in, uh, data, uh, it will get chunks. For each chunk, it will retrieve the check bytes as well, process them, possibly locate errors, correct them if it can, um, return the clean data and uh, report a, stasi a status. Status is the number of bit flips, which is very important, and eventually if an error occurred. The number of bit flips is very useful for the non-core, uh, so that it can move the data away and and uh, clean the blocks. And this will this is a bit out of scope for this presentation, but is is very important to not wear out your device too quickly. The first algorithm I want to talk about, which is the most important in the non-world, I think, is the Hamming algorithm. So it was created in 1950 by Richard W. Hamming that you see on the picture. Um, it was first created to cover um, errors from punched card readers, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, at this time, the density wasn't uh, such a problem. Uh, it's able to correct up to one bit error per shank, and it may detect up to two bit errors per shank. That's uh, that can't be changed. It was very. It is still used for um, strong SLC non chips, and most of the existing uh, non row non controllers uh, embed a hardware hamming as ECC engine. Uh, Linux as well provides a software hamming uh, ECC implementation that Ronan may use. This may be useful uh, if the ECC engine is not reliable or if you don't have an ECC engine uh, in your IP, which is not very common though. The second algorithm, which is much more strong than hamming and uh, which allows fine tuning is BCH. BCH uh, has been invented in 1959 and 1960, uh, independently in France and America. It's a very powerful. Uh, it fits all the nine, all the nines, because you can uh, freely choose the strength that will apply over any shank size of your choice. So this is. Um, this is very, uh, this matches completely our use case. And also it carries the data unaltered, which as a developer, I really like because uh, well, during my debugging sessions, it's very nice to see the data um, in the pages and you can easily understand if it's not located at the right, um, uh, right location in the page or if the correction is not working properly and so on. Uh, it, it has a very good uh, ratio overhead over correction capabilities. Uh, it's um, It doesn't need so much extra bytes to cover a quite strong correction. Uh, the only limitation is, of course, the out-of-band area. So if you have an out-of-band area of 64 bits and 62 uh, bytes, sorry, and 62 bytes are reserved for the ECC engine, that's the most you can do. And you can't use a correction that would need maybe 70 or 75 bytes. Uh, it's interesting to know that the read path is almost uh, 10 times more complex than the write path. That's why we usually use uh, hardware BCH engines. But still, uh, it's, it's still configure, considered as rather inexpensive because it leverages polynomial, uh, polynomial algebra of uh, binary data. data. And um, the point of decoding with uh, BCH is um, trying to find roots of polynomials, which is something we know how to do efficiently now. Of course, the more the the, the, the biggest the strength, uh, the more complicated are the polynomials, and the more time you will need to decode it. 
while on the other hand the encoding pass is rather simple because it's more or less uh, uh, convolutions between polynomials. I don't want to enter more in details and talk to take too 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 much time uh, talking about BCH. If you are if you are interested, I I wrote um, a blog post because I worked recently on a misbehaving ECC engine that I had to work around by software, and for that I had to understand how it worked internally. And I had to uh, retrain engineer the the engine the engine to to retrieve the primary polynomials. Uh, everything is explained there. Of course, if you need more 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 a better understanding of the of the algorithm, there are many people explaining it on explaining it on the internet. And this blog post also contains a um, a MATLAB script. Um, which can be used by anyone to 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 um, to return engineer uh, BCH uh, hardware engine. Of course, our Linux also provides a customable a customizable software BCH engine, um, which may be used, for instance, if your if your engine engine is not. Uh, behaving properly, or if the hardware only has a uh, hamming support, while you need a uh, stronger correction. Uh, these are examples of use. The last one, the last algorithm, which I think is very important, is the Reed Solomon algorithm. Uh, it got invented in 1960 as well, and it has two major differences uh, with the BCH. The first one is it considers symbols instead of bits. So if you have many bit errors in a single symbol, let's say a symbol is a byte, then this will be considered for the algorithm by the algorithm as a single bit error, a single error, a single failure. So this makes uh, read Solomon codes well suited to fight burst errors. But in the non world world, um, burst errors are not so common. Also, it treats lack of data differently than bit failures. Um, it may correct up to two times more data that is uh, that has been lost than errors that are unknown. Lack of data means we know where the data is missing, while, while bit failures uh, are referring to random failures that we have to locate first. Uh, it's a bit less common than BCH, but uh, there are uh, hardware engines um, on non-controller driver on non-controllers that uh, that use this algorithm. Um, finally, about this algorithm, the CDs are using some kind of a Reed Solomon algorithm. It's called CIRC for Cross Interleaved Solomon Code. It's basically two levels of uh, Reed Solomon encoding with a convolution in between. So that if a um, block of data is not recoverable at all because of a scratch or, well, you have uh, several consecutive bits that are uh, unreadable, this uh, area is considered as uh, as uh, well, you, you as a lack of data, and because of the convolution, each byte of this block will be is actually part of another block, and the first level read Solomon code will be able to recover this missing symbol in between all the good data that is around, and that's how you can achieve so high, uh, so so powerful uh, correct capabilities uh, and correct up to 4k of uh, consecutive uh, errors. So now let's talk about the ECC engine support in Linux. So there are two subsystems in Linux uh, about NAND. There is the raw NAND world, parallel NAND world, and the spy NAND world. Uh, both are really different. The Ronan subsystem is very old 
and carries a lot of history. The spine and uh, subsystem is much more recent. So let's first talk about Rodnant. Um, this picture shows how people uh, used to um, used to imagine uh, how the hardware was. They usually forget about the ECC engine that is embedded in the non-host controller. And this was even worse in the past because the device, the bus, the controller and the ECC engine were treated as a whole in the past by Linux. So we recently separated all these um, all these devices. Uh, we, non we now have a non-chip structure, a non-controller structure, a non-ECC controller structure, but we still have um, a single driver that mixes the non-controller support and the ECC engine support. About spinance now. Well, this has uh, needed some rework recently. Uh, at the creation in V4.19, um, all spine on devices we knew had a hardware ECC engine embedded in them. We call that an Ondai ECC engine. engine. Um, no software engine was available yet. Even if in the run on the world they were existing, they were not supposed to be used with uh, spine and devices. But today, we see new devices coming out without these on the ECC engines. Maybe it's cheaper to manufacture. Uh, it's also more pow powerful if you offload it to a dedicated hardware. And you may materialize uh, the, the correction between chips if you have several of them. But the Spain and subsystem was really not ready for that. So this is the situation now. The first picture at the top is what we've had before. The second picture is uh, the exam an example of when the ECC engine is external. So it's not on the pipelines anymore. It's an external IP that may be used to process the data and decode it later. Or in the third uh, picture, you, you see that we can have hardware ECC engine that are now embedded in spy host controller. So now that we know that we may have a, a, a wide range of available external um, available ECC engines, we need to discriminate uh, the engines uh, one and the other. What are the differences? So we had to decide uh, what common properties all these engines um, shared. Well, basically the type is common to all engines and is very important. So is it pipeline or not? Is it external? Is it on the die on the, on the host controller? Um, what strength does it support? And also um, over what shank size? These are the most basic information, the most important information uh, for an ECC engine. But depending on who you listen to, you will have different information about you, you will receive different information for these um, uh, for these properties. The non-chip will advertise you what it requires. So it has requirements. You should be above these strengths and you should use um, a layout that fits the memory layout of the non-chip. The user may want to use a specific um, a specific uh, strength and step size as well, or even a specific um, en engine. And of course, if you miss information, you must have a default values. And these default values are subsystem wide. With, with all of that in, in, in hand, the non-core is supposed to choose 
first the right ECC engine with the non-dev get ECC engine function you see on the screen, and then find the right configuration for this ECC engine and init it properly. Um, the, the retrieval of the ECC engine depends on the bindings on the on the device tree. And we have to extend we had to extend the bindings to fit the new use case. Uh, let's have a look at the top left um, snippet. This is the most common case with Spinance. All, all these snippets uh, are Spinance uh, related. Um, you usually ha don't have to, to tell where is the ECC controller because it's uh, on day one by default. But uh, we added the, the, a new property, which is non-ECC engine. And this one must point to the, the flash node itself uh, in the, with the new bindings. Of course, if this line uh, is not um, populated in the device tree, uh, thanks to backward compatibility and the fact that the Spinance system default is an on die engine, you it an old device tree will still work with the with the recent changes. It's new now. You can use software ECC engines with uh, Spinance. So in this case, uh, please use the Boolean property non use soft ECC engine and the ECC algorithm you want to use. No need to to force a specific um, a specific value of strength and step size. The core is clever enough to to find the the best fit. Now, if you want um, if you want to use an external ECC engine. Then you will have another um, device tree node for this ECC engine, and you can just point to it with a non ECC engine property. That will be fine. And finally, if the engine is on the host, you may point with a non ECC engine contained in the flash node to the, to the spy host controller. And if the spy host controller needs to refer to an external node, it's also possible with the same property. People, um, when writing um, ECC engines drivers, uh, there are actually just four hooks to implement. It's pretty easy. An init and cleanup context hook uh, hooks. These are here to configure the ECC engine for a given uh, NAND. Um, all the um, all the informations are in the structure we've seen a bit before. The point is now the ECC engine should be ready and preparing and finishing the request, the IO request with the two other hooks should be as fast as possible. Then the two other um, the two other uh, hooks should enable the engine, maybe do some processing and. Uh, move the data if needed, and so on. It's really tied tight to the ECC engine. It may be pretty simple or very complicated depending on the cases. These operations are part of a wider uh, structure, which is the non-ECC engine structure. Um, this one will be registered at boot time uh, in a system-wide list of all the available ECC engines, and the core will, um, when the core uh, looks for an ECC engine, it it looks uh, it looks into this list. So that's that's the end of my presentation. Um, Right now, all I've told you is still, um, well, half of it is still work in progress. The other half is uh, already um, merged. Uh, we don't have bootloader support yet, so it's only working in Linux and bootloaders won't, don't, I don't know any bootloader already supporting uh, external um, ECC engines. Um, the ROM non-core 
would benefit from a deeper clean uh, cleanup again. Uh, it's quite difficult to make it fit the ECC, uh, the generic ECC engine abstraction. It would break numerous drivers, but uh, that would be a, a, a good step forward. Of course, I hope to receive new ECC engine drivers. And um, as a hope, as opening, um, I recently heard about Northflash is carrying an Arming ECC engine. Uh, it's not because of the, the technology being unstable, but because of automotive safety constraints. I wonder if if it will be offloaded someday. Uh, honestly, um, MTD is not ready for that. Well, thank you very, very much uh, for attending. I should be there to answer questions now. Bye.